The merciless wild. The heartless seas. When nature unleashes her cruelty, could you escape? Could you survive? These are the true stories of outdoorsmen confronted by death, armed with raw courage and a will to live. They are the ones who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. It's another perfect day of spear fishing for a band of friends on the Gulf. It was a beautiful day. It was clear, calm, perfect. But the tranquility and beauty are about to be torn apart by a set of vicious jaws. Ah! And I looked down and saw it was a shark. A young man's life hangs in the balance after an unprovoked attack from out of the ocean's depths. Within a split second, there's a five-foot radius of blood around him. And now courage and selfless loyalty will be tested to the utmost. I didn't think he was going to make it in. He was white as a ghost. September 24th, 2011 is another gorgeous day off Longboat Key, Florida. A group of lifelong friends head into the Gulf of Mexico for a day of spearfishing. It's a trip they've taken hundreds of times, but today's adventure would be very different. C.J. Wickersham's family has lived in this fisherman's paradise since the 1920s. My dad, my pretty much everybody in my family grew up fishing, and then so I started fishing when I was probably one or two, when I could hold a pole. CJ and best friend Connor Bystrom have grown up together here. And their sport of choice is spear fishing. We met in elementary school. We grew up together. And we, we've always fished and played sports together. And we just bonded ever since we were kids. Well, spear fishing, we would wake up early, head offshore, go out more than 15 miles in the Gulf, have different wreck numbers, and jump in. And then we, we'd chum up some fish and go down there and spear them. I grew up doing that. And then all my buddies do it, so we go out all the time, every weekend. Today, it's the usual crew. There's CJ and Connor, Katie, Oshi, Kira, Lee, and Max. The friends set a course west-northwest for Anna Maria Island, dropping anchor four miles offshore. First spot, it's like 35, 40 feet deep, and then we want to try that for our first spot to see if there's any hogfish or grouper on it. So Connor and Lee and Max all got in the water and started diving. The group likes to free dive. They use no scuba gear, no tanks, no regulators, no weights, and no air except what they can hold in their lungs as they plunge deep with their spears. It's pretty cool to be able to just hold your breath for a few minutes and go down like 50, 60, 70, 80 feet on a breath of air and shoot like a big 20, 30 pound grouper or big amberjack or big hogfish or something of that sort. Spear fishing is hunting underwater. The fish, you're like in their environment, you know where to hide and stuff, so you gotta try to find them like where they get in there. Like the grouper will go into like the ledges and the holes and you gotta try to find them like back up inside there and get them out which is pretty fun to do. That's pretty thrilling. Like hunters, spear fishermen spot and stalk the largest specimens without having to depend on the luck of hook and bait. When we go spearing, we shoot a lot of grouper, which range probably from 24 to 35 inches, which is probably 10 to 20 pounds. A lot of the fish we try to shoot, which are really good, are hogfish. And they're usually probably from like 14 inches to 20, 22 inches. So I mean, probably the biggest, like five, six pounds. Lee and Connor shoot two hogfish each, but they're hunting for grouper or snapper. They pull the anchor and head another mile out and find the right spot. Every time we went down, one of us would shoot uh, at least a hogfish or a mango snapper, and it was fairly clear. You could almost see top to bottom, so it was a good day. 
The buddy system is crucial in diving. Dozens of feet down with just the air in your lungs, anything can go wrong. Getting tangled in line or stuck in the rocks or dragged off by a big catch. You need your friends close by to keep an eye out. These waters are also filled with bull sharks. Despite their fearsome reputations, sharks are not a major concern for CJ and his friends. Usually when we will go out and spearfish on wrecks in different areas, you'll see sharks all the time. They usually come in and they kind of check you out and then kind of roll on their way. Bulls are among the most notorious of sharks. Large, up to 12 feet and 500 pounds, they will swim into shallow water and even into freshwater rivers and lakes. Bull sharks are believed responsible for the series of fatal attacks on the Jersey Shore in July 1916 that inspired the novel and movie Jaws. Their one saving grace is that they take time to grow curious, so a diver usually has a chance to put some distance between him and the shark. When we're spearfishing and we get a bunch of sharks come in, it gets too sharky, um, we'll pull the anchor and go to another spot uh, just to kind of get away from that. An inherent risk of spearfishing is the blood speared fish put in the water. We'll shoot a fish and swim back to the boat and throw it in the boat, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be sharks around. They're always around somewhere. When you're spearing, all the fish are going to bleed no matter where you shoot them, and that does release blood, and that blood attracts sharks. It's a possibility with that kind of sport, I mean, shooting fish and then bleeding, that it, you can get attacked. This Saturday, CJ and his dive buddies are taking care. They're keeping their stringers and fish blood out of the water, and not a single shark has come in, even to have a look. It was actually a great morning. It was a beautiful day. It was clear, calm, perfect. We speared a bunch of fish that day, shot quite a few hogfish and grouper. We never, never saw a shark in the water all day. The shark that bites, though, is not the one you see, but the one that sees you. You see them all the time, and you know you're, you're aware of them, but you just never think it's actually going to happen. I never really thought that I would get attacked by a shark when I was out there diving. CJ thought wrong. It's a sunny September Saturday of spear fishing for seven friends in the Gulf of Mexico. By early afternoon, the stringers hold a dozen hogfish, three decent groupers, and some mangrove snapper. Some of the group are taking a break on board the boat, while others are off the back, sunbathing on inflatable rafts. And 21-year-old C.J. Wickersham is in the water, alone free diving with his spear gun in search of the catch of the day. I went down, shot a hogfish, came back and put it in the boat. And then I hopped back in, because when I shot that one, I saw a few more good-sized ones down there. Went back down one more time, shot at a mango snapper, and I missed it. So I came back up top and was just sitting there for a second, catching my breath before I loaded my gun. And then the next thing, I kind of, I felt a like a bump, hug on my leg, then I looked down and saw it was a shark. I saw CJ kind of flail on the water, popped his head up and started screaming, and then within a split second there was a five foot radius of blood around him, and you just knew it wasn't good. Without the possibility of flight, CJ's fight response takes hold as he pounds on the shark. I took both of my fists like closed and like hit it as hard as I could on the nose. But I just looked down and I could see it was kind of like a flap on my bathing suit ripped open. Connor reacts with blind courage, diving into the water to swim to his friend's rescue. I remember Connor jumping in the water really fast. He only had one flipper on. They swam over to me as fast as he could. When I jumped in the water, saw his leg, could see his femur. It was pouring blood out so fast, like it looked like a faucet was turned on underwater with blood coming out of it. I mean, it shocked me. I just saw it, and I just I yelled back to the boat before I got to him to just have a rope ready to tie off the leg. And I grabbed him. We swam back to the boat. Max and Lee grabbed him around his shoulders and pulled him over the boat. It's a gory spectacle that sends terror through almost everyone. A gaping wound 15 inches across, punctuated by ragged tooth marks. 
Once we got back to the boat, I just kind of like closed his wound and I had a rope and I just kept twisting it until I couldn't twist anymore. And then his leg just turned white and he quit bleeding. Meanwhile, Kira was on the phone to 911. They were telling us what to do. We needed to put pressure on the wound and wrap towels around it until, I mean, they're like, if it bleeds through the towel, we'd wrap another one around it. Katie and Oshie handed towels over to me and I was wrapping them around his leg and just holding it and the first two towels bled through and we, I think we ended up putting three on it and then you wouldn't see blood through the third towel so I didn't think he was going to make it in. He was white as a ghost. He was complaining that his chest was tingling from a few miles offshore and his hands were really tingling and the only thing I could think of is that he probably doesn't have too much blood left. Lee kept talking to him and giving him water and holding his head while we were full throttle in. Um, from six miles out, so I think that helped a lot. Strangely, the only one who seems unaffected is CJ. I don't remember seeing what it looked like. It didn't really hurt too bad at first, and then once they pulled me in the boat and they tied the tourniquet off, my hands and uh, feet and everything started like tingling. I didn't really feel like too much pain because their teeth are so sharp, it just hit right through it. It didn't really hurt too bad. The lack of pain and CJ's lethargy are danger signs. The shark's bite has severed the femoral artery, and the rapid loss of blood from the massive wound has sent him into shock. His body is shutting down, his life slipping away. Unless the bleeding can be stopped by his friends, CJ will be dead in a matter of minutes. The 911 operator calls ahead for a medevac helicopter to be waiting on standby at the nearest rendezvous point off Rod and Reel Pier on the northern end of Anna Maria Island. At the boat's helm, Max has the throttle wide open to cross the six miles of Gulf waters as swiftly as possible, while CJ's friends struggle to keep him conscious. Every second counts as blood runs out over the boat's deck. All of CJ's friends are working together to keep him awake and alive. It began as another Saturday of spearfishing for a group of young friends from Longboat Key, Florida. Now, CJ Wickersham is fighting for his life after an ambush attack by a 10-foot bull shark. The predator has jaws with bite force of nearly 500 pounds, and it has slashed CJ's thigh to the bone, cutting the femoral artery. They're now in a desperate race to get him to shore. They laid me on the floor, and Lee got behind my head and held my head up, and then Connor got the anchor rope and tied it off my leg like as tight as he could for a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Once I saw the wound and how much he was bleeding. I didn't think we were gonna be able to stop it. I didn't think he was gonna make it in. He was white as a ghost. He was complaining that his chest was tingling from a few miles offshore and his hands were really tingling. And the only thing I could think of is that he probably doesn't have too much blood left. And they just try to keep me calm or give me water and stuff and tell me it was gonna be okay. They were trying not to really, they didn't wanna freak me out by saying that it was really bad or what it looked like. Sometimes I felt like I was gonna go unconscious, but I was trying to keep myself awake. I told him to call my parents. Kira makes the call, first to CJ's mom, then to his dad. Well, it was a Saturday afternoon and uh, about three o'clock, and I'd just taken a shower, and I heard a scream come out of the, my bedroom. I went in there, and my wife, Ella, had said that CJ had just been bitten by a shark, and that they were bringing him in to the pier to see what they could do for him. The run to the pier seems like a slow motion nightmare for CJ and everyone else in the boat trying to keep him alive. On the way in, CJ was very calm. He was responsive the whole way. He was never going in and out of consciousness. He was, he was always there. He was drinking water. And he was actually complaining about his heels hurting and not his, not his, uh, his leg, just from him leaning on the gunwale. So CJ was very calm. I think he had a lot of trust in us. Everything that we told him to do, what the 911 was telling us to do, he was just responding and doing everything like he should have. And being CJ and how strong and big he is, I think if it would have bit anybody else, it would have probably been a different outcome. CJ is just clinging to consciousness when the boat reaches shore. We ran into the Rod and Reel Pier. 
the EMS was waiting on the pier. I didn't think we'd be able to at least lift CJ up onto the dock, so Max just ran in and grounded the boat right onto the beach, and the EMS walked out, and they wanted to see the extent of the wound to get the helicopter there. The boat hit the bottom, so then I knew we were at the beach, and right when we got there, the paramedics were waiting. So they cut off the towels, and right when they saw it, they called the helicopter. And we got him up onto the gunnel, and they put him on a stretcher. Connor later told us that when they got to the beach, he said the boat was just a pool of blood. They brought the backboard out and put me in the ambulance right off the boat. Connor wants to climb into the ambulance to ride with his friend to the hospital. Not sure if this will be the last time he sees him alive. Once he got into the ambulance, I, I really wanted to go with him, but I couldn't go. The ambulance speeds three miles down the road to the Anna Maria Community Center. The medevac helicopter is standing by, engines running. It's a flying surgical unit, and the one chance C.J. Wickersham has of surviving his terrible wound. By the time they got me in the helicopter, that's when they gave me like five or six units of blood, which you only have, they say, like eight to 10 units of blood in you, so I lost more than half my blood by the time that I had gotten to the uh, helicopter. C.J. is flown to Bayfront Medical Center in St. Petersburg, and his family and friends rush to his side. We really had no idea. It was definitely a scary experience, and we had no idea how bad he was bitten. C.J.'s distraught parents arrive just minutes before he is taken in for his first emergency surgery. When we first got in there in the emergency room, he was covered up. They had a sheet over him and everything, and he was totally white, and he was, you know, really hurt. You could tell that. He really didn't say much. You know, we just kind of looked at him and just told him we loved him, and then he, they wheeled him off. As C.J. enters the operating room, no one knows how he will come out. Will he keep his leg? Will he even survive? It began as another Saturday of spearfishing for a group of young friends from Longboat Key, Florida. Now, C.J. Wickersham is fighting for his life after an attack by a 10-foot bull shark. It's the least expected kind of shark attack, an unprovoked ambush, raw feeding behavior. These waters have seen only five such attacks since records started being kept in 1882. CJ's is number six. The courageous friends who rushed him to shore pray for CJ's survival. Fate is on CJ's side, though, in the form of a surgeon who has faced the worst kinds of trauma. We were lucky to have this surgeon, Jeffrey Johnson, who had just come back from Afghanistan and Iraq. I think he served a couple tours over there. He was definitely qualified because he saw a lot worse things in Afghanistan and Iraq than CJ's accident. Apparently, it didn't phase him too bad. It takes an hour and a half and over 800 stitches for Dr. Johnson and his team to clean and stabilize CJ's wound. When he came out, all his friends, my brother, his sisters, uh, Connor and all them, Jeannie, his mother, all his friends that were on the boat were in the waiting room. And the doctor came out and said that he lost a lot of blood and that he probably would lose a lot of tissue and that he'd probably have four to five surgeries. CJ has made it this far because his friends banded together to keep him from bleeding out and to get him rescued. Their efforts have saved CJ's life. Everybody who was on the boat the next day went down there to see CJ. It was an amazing feeling to actually be able to see him again. It was like Christmas morning. CJ has to be given enormous amounts of antibiotics to stave off possible life-threatening infection. A lot of times when you get bit, they say a lot of bacteria in the salt water and that's really dirty in the shark's mouth, like a really dirty animal, like their mouth. And a lot of times you, they would think you would get infected. The recuperation is long and grueling, but amazingly, CJ makes a full recovery. Now CJ's back to doing what he loves, including spearfishing, though not every Saturday. 
I'm lucky the shark didn't shake its head, which they do a lot of times when they bite stuff. Like you see on TV, they'll bite it and it'll shake, but I don't know if I hit it fast enough when it bit or if it just didn't like, or what it tasted like when it bit me, that it let go and didn't shake or tear any of my meat, just kind of ripped it open. Connor and CJ's friends will forever hold a special place with the Wickersham family. Yeah, Connor definitely saved my life. All my friends did, Lee, Max, Kira, Oshie, and Katie, all what they did, like, kept me calm while they, Kira called 911 and Max drove the boat and stuff. So, I mean, they all definitely saved my life. What Connor did for him means a lot that he would jump in the water after I just got bit by a, by a 10 foot bull shark. There was blood all over the place and he jumped in without even thinking and just grabbed me. And then, I mean, it's like, he's pretty much like my brother. And, uh, he would do that and risk his life to save mine to get me out of the water. Connor, definitely a hero. If it were not Connor, I wouldn't have a son today. Yeah, I really, I love him a lot. Life at Longboat Key goes on now, and it's still a paradise, made even more so by the realization of how precious life can be. After seeing something like that, I definitely have more respect for the water. It's just anything can happen in a split second. It was just a perfect day, and just within a split second, it turned into, you know, a horror story. So I get to spearfish and do all the stuff I love. Hey, I'll be with my family and fish and dive and hunt and everything. Yes, I definitely I love every day. I don't take it for granted that I'm here. 